On Christmas Eve, 1968, astronaut Bill Anders snapped a photo of the Earth as Apollo 8 orbited the moon. Those three guys were surprised to see from their eyes a planet looked like an Earth rise, a blue orb hovering over the moon's gray horizon with deep oceans and silver skies. It was our world's first glance at itself, our first chance to see a shared reality, a declared stance, and a commonality, a glimpse into our planet's mirror. And as threats drew nearer, our own urgency became clearer as we realized that we hold nothing dearer than this floating body we all call home. We've known that we're caught in the throes of climactic changes some say will just go away while some simply pray to survive another day. For it is the obscure, the oppressed, the poor who when the disaster is declared done still suffer more than anyone. Climate change is the single greatest challenge of our time. Of this you're certainly aware, it's saddening, but I cannot spare you from knowing an inconvenient fact because it's getting the facts straight that gets us to act and not to wait. So I tell you this not to scare you, but to prepare you, to dare you to dream a different reality where despite disparities, we all care to protect this world, this riddled blue marvel, this little true marvel to master the verve and the nerve to see how we can serve our planets. You don't need to be a politician to make it your mission to conserve, to protect, to preserve that one and only home that is ours to use your unique power to give next generations the planet they deserve. We are demonstrating, creating, advocating. We heed this inconvenient truth because we need to be anything but lenient with the future of our youth. And while this is a training and sustaining the future of our planet, there is no rehearsal. The time is now, 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 because the reversal of harm and protection of a future so universal should be anything but controversial. So, Earth, pale blue dots we will fail you not just as we chose to go to the moon we know it's never too soon to choose hope we choose to do more than cope with climate change we choose to end it we refuse to lose we do this and more not because it's very easy or nice but because it is necessary because with every dawn we carry the weights of the fates of this celestial body orbiting a star and as heavy as that weight sounded it doesn't hold us down but it keeps us grounded steady ready because an environmental movement of this size is simply another form of an earth rise to see it close your eyes visualize that all of us in this room and outside of these walls or in these halls, all of us change makers are in a spacecraft floating like a silver raft in space and we see the face of a planet anew. We relish the view, we witness its round green and brilliant blue which inspires us to ask deeply, wholly, what can we do? Open your eyes, know the future of this wise planet is right in sight, right in all of us. Trust this earth uprising, all of us bring light to exciting solutions never tried before, for it is our hope that implores us at our uncompromising core to keep rising up for an earth more than worth fighting for. It's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Peter Schlosser, our Vice President and Vice Provost of Global Futures. Peter. Thank you, Jason. We are here to celebrate Earth Day, and we actually have to keep in mind that this is the 51st anniversary since Earth Day was created. And of course, Earth Day was created because people recognized that we had put a lot of pressure onto our planet, that negative adverse effects were showing up and they appealed to us to react to that 
to lessen the pressure onto the planet. And it was not just Earth Day that happened around that half century ago. There was also the warnings from the Club of Rome. There was the publication of Silent Spring. So we cannot say that we didn't have warnings long ago, too long ago, that we have to respond to the issues that we have created for our planet and us as part of the Earth system. Now, on the positive side, quite a bit has happened. Quite a few positive things have happened, Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act, and many other things I could name. At the same time, there is so much to be done and so much that has not been done. And sometimes one has to wonder why not? Why did we not react faster in view of these threats that are showing up more frequently in more places and higher amplitudes? And in view of the fact that we actually, for many of these problems in principle, we have options how to approach them. So as we celebrate this 51st uh, birthday, we should reflect upon that and in order to you know, move that reflection along from our side on one specific area, we will have as the core of our today's presentation and celebration, a conversation with uh, Greg Asner and Haunani Kane about the work of the Center for Global Discovery and Conservation Science on their work on conservation on looking at the planet, what the issues are, but also moving us into that space where they provide from their work, from their insight, options for solutions, support for decision-making. We will get to that part, which is the core of today's celebration shortly. But first, I would like to take a few minutes to advertise our, brazenly advertise our own work and the results of that by referring to the release of the latest uh, impact rankings by the Times Higher Education for 2021. And most of you know that the impact rankings are based on how well institutions are doing in furthering the causes of the 17 sustainable development goals. So in that ranking, ASU has retained its number one spot in the United States. We are also in the top 10 globally, and that is a ranking among more than 1,100 institutions. This ranking actually demonstrates our commitment, global commitment, to helping bring people together in their quest of driving impact through research, knowledge, and the solutions that can be derived from them. So I would like to congratulate the entire Global Futures team, community, and all our partners across the globe for committing to that and being recognized in that a really wonderful way by being ranked number one in impact.
I hope you all enjoyed that short video clip. With that, we will move to the main section of our celebration today, which is a conversation with uh, Greg Asner and Honani Kane. And I will introduce them shortly, but just preface the introduction by saying that the topic about which we will uh, shape this discussion is the preservation of main ecosystems and their functions. Many of them are threatened. We will also, within that topic, address the, the corals globally and the uh, coral atlas. And the reason why that is such a good uh, topic to, to use to lay out what Earth Day is all about is that it is a system that is iconic in a way, but it also is really um, you know, one of the systems that are, are under high threats to, in essence, go extinct if we keep the pressure on them. So we will see how Greg and how Nani are actually addressing that problem, what methods they are using to understand it, and how they use their knowledge to help us make the right decisions in going forward and bring them back on course. So now, brief introductions. Greg Asner is the director of the Center of Global Discovery and Conservation Science in the Global Futures Laboratory. He holds also appointments in the schools of geographical sciences and urban planning and earth and space exploration. His background is in biology, where he got his PhD. Greg is an ecologist who develops scientific approaches and technologies for investigation and conservation assessments of large eco-regions, systems within these regions, but also large spatial footprints. He, in his center, resides the Global Airborne Observatory, which is an advanced global mapping laboratory outfitted into a custom airplane. His center has recently acquired the Allen Coral Atlas. Some of you might have heard of that. And we will talk about that as part of the conversation, which is actually a revolutionary digital mapping of the planet's coral habitats and also a monitoring of their health. Honani Kane is a scientist, server, and voyager from Kailua, Oahu, who just joined ASU this year after completing her PhD at the University of Hawaii. She's blending observations and traditional knowledge to form a worldview that focuses upon the similarities rather than the differences among Western and indigenous science. Honani uses her expertise to help provide deeper context to the impacts of climate and climate change on biodiversity on our planet. She's also an assistant navigator and science coordinator for the Polynesian Voyaging Society. So let's uh, start the conversation. So Greg, could you provide us with a bit of background about the mission of your center, how it came to be, how you developed a passion for it, and how eventually you found your way to ASU. Okay, well, uh, first of all, happy Earth Day, Peter, and Haunani, it's great to join you here today. Really, really a pleasure. Um, yeah, GDCS, Global Discovery and Conservation Science, is one of the newer centers at ASU. We're just a little over two years old. Uh, I came to ASU because uh, of the mission, the charter of the university, of the vision of President Crow and people like you, Peter, who give us the, the kind of leadership that lets us innovate in this space. And um, GDCS as a center is an expression of that. Uh, we're, we're growing. Um, our mission really is to lead spatially, spatially explicit scientific and technological research that's focused in a solutions-oriented way on mitigating and adapting human life and the rest of the natural world to global environmental change. Uh, when I think about some of the traits of our center, even though we're young, we have some, some common threads among now nine faculty 
Hanani is uh, our, one of our newer faculty members. Um, one is that we're spatially explicit. Uh, we try to develop understanding and solutions that really work on the ground or at sea. Um, we're also culturally specific. We're sensitive to the fact that the world is a complex fabric of cultures. And so one size doesn't fit all. So our science, even though it's at scale, acknowledges and works with that complexity. Uh, another common thread is time. Uh, some of us work in satellite time, which takes us back to maybe 1980. Another part of our, our team works in paleo time, looking at ice core data or uh, geologic record. And yet the third and possibly the most important aspect of time is that of intergenerational knowledge. Uh, the knowledges that have been passed down through the generations of humanity's uh, experience on the earth in the earth system. Um, the, and most importantly, perhaps is our center is a center of diverse faculty. And the reason I'm focused on the diversity of our faculty is because I think we all know that diverse origins yield diverse solutions. And that's really what we're facing here. Solutions at scale from multiple perspectives. So thanks for uh, inviting me and that's a bit about our center. Uh, thank you. Onani, you, you studied uh, the, the Earth and, and its past, and you are using different perspectives to look at the problems that, that we are dealing with, and also the basic understanding. How are you using, we, we often talk about, you know, the need to bring together different knowledge systems. And you are, of course, you know, you grew up in one you know, fundamental knowledge uh, system in an, air, in, a, in, a, in an environment where this knowledge system still lives on much more than in many other regions. But you're also using scientific methods. So how are you using these different uh, approaches and how do you integrate them to address the questions that Greg laid out as the mission of the center? Yeah, um, mahalo Peter for that question. And I just wanna say aloha kako to everyone. Um, mahalo Nui, thank you for having me here today and um, happy Earth Day to all of you. Um, when I think about the research that I do and how my research has been shaped as a Hawaiian and how I've been shaped by the experiences that I've had, um, a lot of that is the product of the time that I've spent on a canoe or a va'a. Um, during my PhD, I had this crazy idea. I was gonna sail around the world on a double hull canoe, as well as um, try to get a PhD in, um, in climate sciences. But yeah, so here's the va'a, the canoe that um, I spent a lot of my time during my PhD on. This is Hokulea. And as you can see, when you sail from say Hawaii to Tahiti or from the Galapagos to Rapa Nui um, or Easter Island, you're open to all of these elements. Um, when we navigate, we don't navigate using a GPS or a sextant, but we're guided by the ancestral practices and knowledge of our kupuna, our ancestors. And we steer the canoe by the wind, by the stars, by not just the feeling of the wind, but the sound of the wind the movement of the stars, the heavily bodies, um, the movement of swells, the rock of the canoe, the speed of the canoe. So when you experience something like that, you really begin to form this relationship with all of the elements that you're surrounded by. And um, today we had a seminar for Earth Day with um, the center where Aleni Wilhelm was talking about conservation. And she was saying one of the biggest challenges, but also biggest solutions with talking about conservation and getting people to really adopt and to own the methods that are established is for them to develop a relationship with the work that you're creating, for them to feel like they have a sense of ownership with it as well. So I think a lot of my experiences on the canoe allowed me to develop a relationship with my work as a scientist as well coming upon an island, pulling a low-lying island out of the sea and seeing the island first by the color of the clouds, by the reflection of the lagoon, and then the tips of the coconut trees, and then spending time with the people there, it really helped me to shape 
my understanding of how islands and reef island systems are impacted by changes in climate. Just a little follow up. I, I often feel that, you know, sailing, navigating the oceans, I, I spent a lot of time on the oceans, but not in such an adventurous way as you did. I was on a research vessel or an icebreaker. Everything was planned and everything, you know, went more or less as, as, as you could foresee. You were venturing much more into the unknown. And sometimes I feel, you know, that's what we are doing with our planet. So does that experience of being out there, feeling the environment, living within it, does that help you to, you know, shape your research, your vision of where the earth as a whole is heading? Yeah, for sure. Um, I feel like, like for myself and for many um, indigenous people, we study climate, we study conservation out of necessity. Um, we study these things and we do work in these fields because we really know that the survival of our people and our places are dependent upon the work and the solutions that we develop. So we keep that in mind. So when we create titles for our publications, the title does not read all islands will be uninhabitable. Um, low lying islands will be uninhabitable in the next 50 years. But rather we look at it from the perspective of what are some of the natural or cultural components of these places and these systems that add to their resiliency. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure if I <laughs> answered your question directly, but another component to this is in terms of thinking of navigation is you always have a plan A, B, C, D, and you keep track of where you're going, but you also keep track of where you've been, where home is. So even if you get lost, you're not really lost because you're keeping track of both where you're going and where you're coming from. That, that's a great answer. So thanks for that. Uh, Greg, we, Haunani already touched upon conservation. And of course, conservation is part of the name of your center. It's, it's part of the purpose that you dedicated your uh, scientific work to. How are you looking at a modern version of conservation in a world that accelerates ever so much uh, since at least the past few hundred years. How, how do we have to understand what conservation means in that dynamic environment? That's a big question. Uh, I think that the key words in the answer to the question rests in adaptation, working with the system as it continues to change, mitigating what we can. It, conservation, that old idea that it means fencing around some sort of ecosystem is a thing of the past. Um, what, what conservation really is, it's working at scale, uh, trying to develop solutions that work at community levels, but then roll up beyond those communities into larger and larger outputs and products and, and, and results and successes. And so that takes technology, it takes social science, it takes the best of our uh, of our data science and and um, and and uh, method methodological approaches, and it, and none of it is done in a vacuum or in a silo. It has to be integrated. So it takes a wide range of talents to pursue these kinds of solutions that are needed at scale. And of course, you you we already have heard what kind of different different approaches there are. You also started to, uh, you know, address why this is done. It is, you know, for people, for understanding how we actually can <clears throat> keep options open for them to shape a future that has opportunities, that has options. So how do you engage uh, people? And, and that's a question for both of you. So maybe Aunani first and then Greg. How, how do you manage to engage people in that kind of uh, discussion in laying out the problems, laying out the urgency, understanding where they see the urgency, but not paint a picture of hopelessness, but a picture that also lays open the opportunities that we have to get out of some of the pressure situations that we have created for ourselves? Yeah, that's a great question. Um... So one of the projects that I'm working on right now is located in Papahanaumokuakea, so a mouthful, but 
Um, it's one of the largest marine protected um, places in the world. It's recognized both for as a world heritage site for both cultural but also natural resources. So when you think of the complexity of a system like that um, here in Hawaii, here's an, um, an image of one of the islands at Lalo. Um, when you think about it, there's multiple, multiple, multiple different goals and objectives of state, federal, um, as well as some nonprofit organizations in managing the resources here. So we're just at the very beginning part of a project of trying to get everybody to come to the table to discuss what is it about places like this that, um, what are the types of habitats that they are interested in managing? What are the resources that rely upon those habitats? Um, how are they impacted by storms? How are they impacted by changes in climate? And what is your ability to plan? Are we, are we talking about an ability to plan five years into the future? Or are we talking about the ability to think to 2150 or 2100? Because that's where a lot of our climate projections are now um, trying to aim their estimates towards. Is something like that even feasible for your organization? And then we think about the cultural component to places like that, where it may not necessarily be a physical tangible feature that we're talking about that is important of this place, but it might be that the entire place itself is representative of pole. It's representative of the most sacred place in um, the worldview of Hawaiians. So really it is a complex issue. I don't think it's something that you can, you can figure out in one conversation, but it's really about forming relationships with the people, the places, and um, even the resources that we are talking about. So Greg, how did you create the conditions for engagement that has continuity and that has the depth. And I assume probably you need to build trust first before you actually can engage in a meaningful way. Mm -hmm. I, I think I understand the question. You know, from a technological side, you can't really work at the community level if your information is too broad, if it's too washed out, if the pixels are too big, so to speak. So from a tech side, you wanna work at fine spatial and temporal resolutions. You wanna get information that matters to people in their locale. And that's only step one from my background. And this is just my part of the, of the story. Um, then you gotta get with that information into communities and invest time, effort, trust building. It's not something you drop off in the mailbox. It's something you, you invest your time in, your team's time in to generate conversation, knowledge exchange, solutions. It's gotta work at community levels or else those communities don't know where they fit into the bigger picture. And then you have to roll this process along and back up to larger and larger scales to try to find efficacy. For example, increasing carbon storage on land. To, as a climate uh, change mitigation measure, or protecting biodiversity, or water quality, or indigenous practices and traditions. Those are all indicators of success or failure at all scales. And so you have to be able to use technology and science and engagement at the finest scales, even individual households in some cases, and work that, work that back up and up and up into regional understanding, decision-making and agreements and, and governance. It's hard, it's long, it's, it's invested. And that's, but it is the pathway to uh, utilizing our science most effectively. Just a little follow-up, uh, when did you start that process and to which extent at this point of your, of your work, this point in time of your, of your work, to which extent is your work actually determined by what you hear in that engagement space that you know people want, need it's, in it, terms of information? And to which extent is it still driven from your perspective of what you think you know has to be delivered? Oh no, I think I know less and less through time. So I've been doing this for a while, two and a half decades, and. Um, 
you know, you, you learn more from your communities that you engage with than you do in any other way. And, and their needs, their, their ideals aren't clear to you as a scientist going top down with science. You have to work both directions, bottom up and top down. And, and it's, it's not really a linear process. It's one that uh, has some circuitous routes that come out of it. Um, it's, you gotta be willing to, you gotta go in knowing that people are much more complicated than a lot of the scientific components of what we bring to those people. And so it, it's, a, it's long and it's, it's, I don't know what to say, what else to say about it, but um, it's, it's a lifestyle. This kind of science is more than just the scientific enterprise. It's a life that you get into in order to find impact, to find partnership and to find efficacy in the end or not. Can you just give us one example where the need of information led to program that you conducted that then translated back and where it changed the way you know people had to deal with the problem where it helped them respond to it oh many um sometimes they're they're small and sometimes they're large um i worked for I years more than a large one i had worked for years in the western amazon basin and that engagement was with communities and government and it was to find common ground in the process of securing carbon on land and biodiversity on land in a way that was going to work for the communities to help them maintain and even enhance their livelihoods while still achieving some of the national level goals of climate change mitigation and biodiversity mitigation, uh, biodiversity loss mitigation. So that was what that looked like was detailed satellite and aircraft based mapping but that was step one, as hard as that was. And then long seven years of engagement inside the government and in those communities, working it out and using geospatial information, high tech methods, data science, uh, basic biology and ecology, all the, the full range. But in the end, it was all about coming to the table, uh, trade-offs, uh, helping people understand not only their local, local place, but their role in the larger space. And uh, that's been a repeating theme in many countries with, with, within which I've worked over the years. Onani, in that engagement with communities, where do you see the role of young people? We have seen Fridays for Future and similar youth movements come up and really make the point that we have been and still continue to narrow their option space for their future. And they actually are very clear that, you know, in, in their requests and demands that this should change. And, you know, especially Fighters for Future is the youngest generation ever that has globally connected to a movement that makes that case. So in, in your work, where, where does that voice come in? Yeah, that, that's a good question. So um, back here in Hawaii, I've been involved with a group called Nakama Kai. And this group, they provide monthly ocean clinics that are about ocean safety, but also ocean conservation free to the community um, and they move to different communities each month so that families, their, their parents can come bring their children and they'll learn how to surf, they'll learn um, how to paddle a canoe, they'll learn about ocean conservation, um, and then they'll also learn about ocean safety. So we'll have a lifeguard there. And it's been amazing watching these kids grow from three to four year olds to now they're actually um, graduating from high school and to see the paths that they're starting to choose. Um, I taught an oceanography course at UH Manoa, I think it was last summer. And two of the students that I knew from when they were like in elementary school were in my class and they were calling me auntie. And I was like, the first time you know, I'm teaching, I'm a professor and they're calling me auntie. And I'm like, okay, I'm gonna just go with it. Um, another one of our students, she is a fashion designer. She has her own line of swimsuits, just got accepted into fashion school. And all of the materials for 
her swimsuits are made out of recycled fishing nets. Um, we just canned a whole bunch of food for another voyage. Um, the canoes are sailing down to the equator this summer. And all of that food, um, like we got the leaves from the kalo, from the taro plants, and we were able to boil them down and can them and give them lily koi butter and jelly, things from Hawaii so that when we plan for these trips, they're eating food from home and not from Costco. Um, so I think the youth is, it's really exciting because all of the generations before that, before us have really put in the hard work to um, lay down the foundation and for, I'm saying myself, but I know I'm like moving into that next generation where I'm not really youthful. But um, so I think now for the youth, it's, it is a fight for them to fight, but it's also a time for them to be creative. It's a time for them to really try different solutions. And it's a time for them to get excited about change because really there is no other solution. And um, like what we heard in the poem about that weight that we feel upon us, like it is a weight to push us, but we've also had so many examples of how you can be successful in change that I think it's also a weight of like excitement to see what we really can do in, in the future. So uh, go ahead, Greg. Can I just put in a plug for something else that I love about ASU? Um, it's that the, the, the models of teaching and learning start at kindergarten at ASU. A lot of people don't know. I didn't know until we started doing this. GDCS as a center is interacting with the education process. ASU prep digital K through 12 systems that are far away from, from campus. They're, they're in K through 12 communities and uh, same with ASU local and and the online systems we're, as a GDCS center we're able to interact with those education processes our faculty are involved in processes from K through 20 20 being PhD I just think that's neat and that helps kind of narrate and helps us to navigate the education space in in the way that Halnani is describing yeah, I often say, you know, ASU with the lifelong learning concept is actually reaching the population from pre-K to what I call Mirabella, our senior living, uh, you know, project that I saw coming up and now I see people moving in there and they move over the campus. It is, you know, the philosophy really has changed. But Aonani, a, a follow-up question to what we what you have talked about with respect to the role of, of young people. When you see that, when you saw that, you know, when, when you saw these kids develop a sense for the environment and engaging, for example, in the business, the fashion business that you mentioned, does that give you hope that we will turn the corner? And just an extension of that question, how do you feel about the future of the planet as a whole? Are you optimistic? Do you have these moments of a little bit of darkness of saying, mm, will we really be able to, to turn the corner? How, how is your outlook on the future? Yeah, I think for me, um, I think there is that, that pressure that we need to get our act together. We need to really think about solutions. We need to think about the impact that we're leaving both, not only negatively, but also positively as well. And thinking about those students, um, man, when I think about the impact that they're gonna have in the future, I, it really just kind of like settles. <laughs> it settles my heart. Cause these students, not only do they know, like for example, um, Keanu Inoue, um, one of my good friends, their daughter, the fashion designer, not only does she know how to sew not only does she know how to design, not only does she know how to find sustainable resources, but she can also tell you the name of the wind in the valley that she lives in. Um, she, she can tell you the name of the different rains. She can tell you the names of all of the beaches and the points near her house. And those are names that have been passed down from generations and generations. And not only can she tell you all those names, but all of her siblings can tell you those names as well. 
and she can speak beautiful Hawaiian. So really like the, a lot of these students, they're rooted in so many different great things aside from, from whatever their educational, traditional educational background may be, but they're just really well-rounded individuals. And again, I think a lot of that comes from the foresight of their parents and the foresight of many other individuals and teachers that came before them that realized, okay, there is value in thinking about the world through multiple lenses. Great. Uh, Greg, do you think Hawaii is special in that way? I mean, we, we know it's special, but let, let me rephrase that. How unique is it and how, how can that relationship with place, with Mother Earth, be translated into other areas? Okay, so yeah, Hawaii stands out for many reasons. And you know, it's nice that Hawaii is an iconic place and most many people on the planet have heard of this place. Um, but Hawaii is its peoples, its cultures, its economies, its biomes, uh, land and sea span a huge range of what we see across the entire planet's surface. And so in a, in a lot of ways, it's, it's testing grounds, it's understanding grounds, it's practice grounds, it's all of these things that we need to, uh, to do here in Hawaii, where I'm speaking to you from as well. Uh, if we can't figure it out here, you wonder if you can get it done anywhere. And so, you know, Hawaii is, people say a model system, it is. It's, but it's also extremely unique in, certain ways and that uniqueness gives us path to understanding the solutions that Haunani is referring to because of the vision and the understanding that you know Hawaiian peoples have brought to us uh, through their long uh, history here and their knowledge and their way of viewing the system and and humanity's place in it. So we learn a lot by working here in Hawaii, not only the technological side and a lot of the technology, our aircraft program and our satellite program, those were all born here because of the model system that Hawaii is, a testing ground, but it's deeper than that. And all of the aspects of this place help us think forward in ways that are challenging, but also if we're gonna get it right, if we're gonna scale, it's got to be in a, in a complex place like the Hawaiian Islands first. So are you an optimist? Yeah. Down the corner? <laughs> I've seen some of the worst of environmental, uh, I've seen uh, environmental atrocities. You could, uh, you know, I've been all over the planet. I've seen really bad stuff, but what still exceeds the bad is the effort for the good. And a lot of people would think that I would be pretty negative uh, after two and a half plus decades of doing this, but I, I do see pathways and solutions. And I see um, it's not just a techno uh, fix, but the technology is helping. Uh, so, you know, I, there's a lot of positives embedded in all of this. And I think it's up to us who can speak to our, our uh, successors to uh, make sure that we're keeping that fire lit and showing that pathway as best we can today. So let's come to the Allen Coral Atlas, which is a tremendous tool, beautiful to look at some of the pictures that are derived from it. Mm. What, what is your vision for taking this atlas to the next step or, you know, maybe, and there's a question to both of you, um, Maybe you can start, uh, Greg, with you know what it does and why we actually, why you were part of creating it, why we you know are in essence mm -hmm. moving mm -hmm. forward, um, and then move from there to what other dimensions can be added to that atlas as it has uh, as it's mapping the habitats right now that would help these habitats. To survive, what what other dimensions would have to be added that would lead us to decisions to manage it better? 
Okay, so the short story is in 2017, the late Paul Allen, one of the Microsoft co-founders and the late Ruth Gates, one of our top marine biologists in, in our history, uh, and I and others got together and, and uh, recognized that working on coral reefs globally was hamstrung by a lack of some of the most basic information. Uh, what we know about our forests on land far exceeds what we know about our coral reefs, primarily because reefs are so far flung, but they're also underwater. So um, it's a hard environment to know. And so how can you manage, come up with solutions, develop conservation strategies, whatever it is, how can you do that without knowing what you've got? And so the Allen Coral Atlas is named after Paul in his honor. And it's, a, it's not just a map, it looks like a map, but it's a monitoring system. It's a, it's a platform to understand changes in not only where the reefs are, but their health and condition, the stresses you see there on that slide, the red is where hot water uh, is, I think yesterday. Um, you know, th these are, these are the, the, the tools that help us get the big picture but also you can zoom in and if this was a live demo, you'd zoom, zoom, zoom in to the smallest coral reef at just a few by few meters and you would see it in the, in these, uh, in the coral atlas. So it's a platform and it's a way to get numerous organizations, cultures, nations working on a common but radically distributed problem which is uh, taking care as best we can of these coral reefs as they go through a pretty tough climate pinch over the next 50 years. So, and then, you know, work like how Nani is describing, it fits perfectly into this kind of context where we can not only map and understand the organisms, but then understand our place and our role with, within, within them and with them. And so um, I'll just let Halnani comment on that. But this is the, this is the Atlas and uh, we, are, we, are, we are innovating around it now too. Uh, it did come, it, it was founded by Vulcan, which was Paul Allen's organization. Uh, this past January, it fully transitioned to ASU management um, I'm lucky to be uh, managing this for a partnership among some really important and uh, powerful contributors to this partnership. Um, but we are going to uh, expand it. Uh, we started with coral reefs and, and we have the first mapping and the first monitoring for coral reefs worldwide. But we're gonna move inland now and we're, gonna, we're trying to define how far inland we're really focused on humanity's role along coastlines the, the mitigative measures we can take in terms of land to sea pollution, all of the other stressors that are combining with climate change to, to cause even more trouble for not only coral reefs, but mangrove systems and seagrass beds. Uh, there's a lot to do. So although we've achieved a lot with the Allen Coral Atlas, I still think it's the early days and uh, just a few years from now, I bet we'll have a much broader and more uh, uh, bigger footprint than what you see here. Aonani, how are you using the Atlas? Yeah, so um, when I think about corals and I think about um, scales of time and I think about viewing things from space and seeing them in person, um, I think about corals a little bit differently. So I'm a geologist by training. A lot of the work that I've done with corals is actually looking at fossils, looking at the paleo record so we'll go down in um, submersibles or ROVs and we'll go down under the water and we'll look for reefs that are thousands um, of years old. And we'll try to constrain an understanding of what climate and what was, what was, it, what was the environment like when these corals were thriving? And what was it, what were the thresholds that um, that caused the system to change. Um, thinking a little closer back in time, um, looking at atoll island systems, a lot of the work that um, I'm doing only goes back about four or 5,000 years <laughs> into the past. And really it's building upon Darwin's model. So we think about Darwin's model and think about island evolution and it really stops at the atoll itself. But when you think about an atoll and it being like a donut shaped ring of coral reef, upon that reef 
it, our islands themselves. And those islands are composed of material entirely derived from the reef system. So here in Hawaii, there is a saying, hey, puko akani aina, which talks about this process where reefs are literally feeding aina or land to these islands themselves. So when I think of reefs and I think of islands, I think of them as a really interconnected system, like Greg was saying, maybe the next phase of the coral, um, the atlas. And I think of these systems of the reef and the island of them feeding each other. So the reefs feeding the people literally with food, but also adding a form of protection. And in some places like atolls, feeding them with land themselves. So it really is a dynamic, a circular um, relationship. And that is the type of systems and work that I'm gonna be doing in the future is exploring more in depth what that means. So if we are looking at, you know, systems that are really threatened in our present world where human activity put a lot of pressure on the planet, corals are among the ecosystems as part of the earth system that are actually, you know, beyond red. They are almost in the purple range next to the, actually ahead of the Arctic system, as, as everybody knows, the Arctic system is also a hotspot of global change. So given your insight, and you both have deep insight into the history of the, of the coral uh, reefs, but also how they have evolved and what, how they look right now, what kind of multiple pressures they are actually experiencing, will they survive? Or let me rephrase that, how, how much of them will survive and what does it need to keep you know, most of them alive? Talnani, you want me to do that one? <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's an interesting thing to think about. So from my perspective of a geologist, when I think about reef islands or islands that are sitting upon fossil reefs, those fossil reef platforms, um, they died in the past because sea level had fallen and they no longer had the accommodation space or the space in the water to grow. So initially, as we see sea level rise, we're gonna see in a lot of places, we're gonna see coral reefs actually starting to come back. We're gonna see a shift in the ecosystem from maybe a calcareous algae dominant system or a, or a foraminifera dominant system to one of a coral dominant system. And I think the ways in which ecosystems will change the timing the rates of sea level rise, the rates of growth of coral themselves. Um, I think that's really an unknown right now. Like we can make predictions, but for the most part, we're still unclear. And that's just thinking about a single stressor. That's thinking about sea level rise itself. That's not taking into consideration temperature and um, acidification. And two of my really good friends are, um, one studies coral bleaching and the other studies ocean chemistry. So we're always like talking about how we need to get together and figure out a multi-stressor approach to these problems. So there's going to be change. Initially, it'll, it may not all be bad, but I think that's the big question that we are all asking. Great. We are reaching the end of our allotted time here. Uh, do both of you have a short closing statement about, you know, how you are looking at the planet moving forward? We already talked about your level of optimism, um, but, you know, Greg, from your perspective, what is needed from academia to really help us stay on course? And Honani, maybe from your perspective, how far did we really come in understanding the different knowledge systems and applying them the right way? On the academia side, I think uh, ASU is a good example of a university that's putting emphasis in the right place. And that is solutions, and that is scale, and that is the latitude to work in different modalities than say the old way of doing academia. Uh, that, that means crossing our disciplinary boundaries 
That means being rewarded for doing that. That means uh, working in teams. And that, and, and it's, it's because not, not one of us can solve this. None of us have the, the full expertise to solve this. So we have to do it in a team oriented fashion. And I think GDCS and GFL and ASU are all reflections of that desire to work on in that new mode, that more modern uh, mode. And that gives me a lot of hope and a lot of, I feel positive about that. Thank you. Yeah, and building off of what um, Greg just said, I think as we move forward and we think about conservation and we think about sustainability and we really think about solutions, I think, I think it is important to think about the places in which we are developing these solutions for. Um, if we, like I said before, if we want to get community buy-in, we need to create solutions that are reflective of both the place and the people. Thank you. Thank you both for a wonderful conversation and very informative uh, conversation. I hope everybody listening, you know, enjoyed it. I'm sure they enjoyed it. So we are not quite done. We have a little treat, especially for those who are uh, in, uh, you know, the ASU community. And that is an update on the headquarters that we are uh, building. It's called ISTP7, Interdisciplinary Science and Technology Building, number seven. It is a headquarters for our activity as no other place has. It will be a tremendous center for our activities radiating throughout ASU and beyond. And we have a little clip of a drone video that Jason will play in now. as excited as I am about the perspectives to live in this 280,000 square foot lead platinum building pretty soon, by the end of the year, it, it should be finished. And um, the next Earth Day, we in all likelihood will celebrate out of, out of that building. Until then, we are looking forward to commencement and convocation ceremonies next week a fall semester with more conversations and interactions, the deployment of focal areas and the uh, Global Futures Office of Research uh, Services, the opening of ISTP7, as I said, end of this year, formally spring next year, the first Global Futures Conference, which will start with build-up events and then the full event will be in fall 2022. And of course, also uh, continuing to be as a laboratory, as a college, as a practice arm, to be a global leader, driving impact and helping to shape, shape a future that has options for future generations. 
with that, I would like to thank everybody for being with us, helping us celebrate this Earth Day, and we will be in touch throughout the year. Thank you.